Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. We've had some nice collaborations with this individual on Instagram. He is someone who is really knee deep in the Red Wolf conservation effort. He's been a photographer for six or seven years. He comes to us from Raleigh, North Carolina, which is really the center of the breeding programs and really the recovery programs for the Red Wolves. He is Zach Lee. Zach, it's so great to meet you, my man. And uh, your, your photos are great. Your video, your message, everything that you're doing is awesome. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much, guys. I'm a huge, huge fan of your podcast. Um, I think everything you guys are doing is great, bringing everyone from uh, different stakeholders, different levels of conservation. I think that uh, what you guys are doing is really important and building a community that effectively, I think, will save the wolf. So thank you. No, we appreciate that. Thank you, man. No, I mean, it's it's great to talk like individuals like yourself who are who recognize the space, who recognize what we're trying to do and, and really trying to play play the middle here. I, I want to jump in and, it, and you're, I think, really the third or fourth person, I think, either in a row or, or almost consecutively, who grew up on the East Coast, um, obviously went to school, and you really, you've gotten into this wild type of either job, profession, whatever it is, working with wild animals. And it just seems to be there's always a, a push or pull, whatever it may be, from the individuals that we've spoken to recently. What was it for you? Uh, just talk about how you grew up, because I think you said before we started your group in New Jersey. Uh, now you're down in North Carolina. So what is it like growing up? Was there always an itch for not only photography, but for wild places, spaces, animals, things like that? Where did you get the bug for that? Yeah, it's uh, my background is interesting. And uh, it, it's always difficult to explain this whenever I do job interviews, too, because um, my background is pretty diverse. But yeah, I grew up in uh, central New Jersey in a small historic village um, right on the Delaware River, uh, maybe 30, 35 minutes from Philadelphia. Um, and I've always loved animals. Um, I think when I was in first grade, I would carry around this um, tiger book. And I think it was called something like Big Cats. Um, and I would carry around and tell everyone how, you know, they're endangered, they're endangered, you know, we have to protect them. And I'm sure from the adult side of uh, point of view, a little two foot human being carrying around a book the size of their torso was probably, you know, hilarious, you know, trying to tell them, like, hey, we need to save this animal. Um, but yeah, it's just been a huge part of my life. And I think probably the Philadelphia Zoo is the big catalyst of it doing school trips. I'm often asked, you know, why someone from New Jersey is a, a Cincinnati Bengals fan. And, you know, everyone in New Jersey is either an Eagles or a Jets fan or a Giants fan, I guess. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be any of that. And I think fourth grade, uh, we did like a, cr a class project where we put our favorite teams on a little piece of like construction paper football to hang in a classroom. And, you know, in your fourth fourth fifth grade you don't really know like what teams are good so i went off a mascot so i was like tigers baby let's go and you know bangles all the way so if you ask me what my favorite basketball team is i'm sure you could guess it's the timberwolves <laughs> um but nice. yeah growing up it's i've always wanted to be a veterinarian if you asked me what i wanted to be it's what i wanted to be and as i get older that expanded uh, you know i wanted to be a wildlife vet you know i wanted to be out there in the woods with the wolves and you know it's just what i wanted but you know as i got to college those aspirations turned a little bit um they turned to actually a law enforcement focus. Um, I became more aware of, you know, that I was getting bullied growing up and I wanted to do something at the time I thought was protecting others. So my, my focus definitely shifted, but um, the animal love has always been there and really exacerbated once I met my wife. What was just describe what that's like, because I, I think I, I followed a similar track as you. Uh, I can't speak for Steven, but I mean, I was, I was the same. I was always, you know, doing animal projects. I was painting animals. I was drawing animals. I was, you know, jaguars, wolves, whatever it was, that was, that was my drive. Wanted to be a vet. Things sort of took a turn, same deal. What got you into, I, I know you described it a little bit, but why the, the, the drastic shift over to, like you say, criminal, you, you got Homeland Security masters, uh, at, at Ryder, um, and then your, your criminal justice psychology in Rutgers. So what was the, what was the drive to that? And then how did you get from security back to, you know, your wild intentions or the, or the things that you were passionate about when you were a kid? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And honestly, it wasn't a direct path or journey. Um, film and photography has always been something that I dabbled in. Um, I think that's probably the tool and instrument that put me into this situation. Um, my brother and I 
would take my dad's Panasonic camcorder and do little home movies with his guinea pig, saving the day from Godzilla, you know, <laughs> that poor guinea pig. I'm sorry, Dasher, rest in peace. Um, and I, just photo editing I learned in high school is something I kept going. But when I met my wife in college, um, her aspirations were to be a marine biologist. Um, and photography was something that she was into because she saw that a lot of biologists also became photographers. So we took some film and photography electives. And that was the point where I've always had some point of camera in my hand, or I'm always on the camera app on my phone or doing something along those lines. And my wife has always been the guiding force behind me doing that. Um, she was um, around the time she got her master's degree, she was working at the Camden Aquarium at the touch tank. And this elderly gentleman, well, I don't want to call him elderly, <laughs> but this um, this gentleman older than her uh, was asking her some questions and he revealed himself to be the biologist working in the lab at the facility at the aquarium. And he basically was like, you know, what are you doing here? Come work for me. And, you know, her being able to do that and me doing my photography, we start talking about like, well, okay, what, what's something that we can do with this? Um, and you know, we start talking about maybe we'll do some short form kind of like documentary content or um, something along those lines. Um, but I had mentioned not putting the camera down when I was doing law enforcement. The processes are long when you do physical training. They're, the testing is excruciating um, physically and mentally. Um, and I would do photography in between because, you know, you, you got to pay bills. But also when I get behind the lens, I just feel really relaxed. You kind of forget the world. You, nothing matters except for what you see through that viewfinder or what's directly in front of you. Um, and I wasn't always doing animals, you know, I, camera equipment is expensive as we all know. So, you know, I was doing, you know, weddings, real estate video, real estate photography, doing whatever. And, uh, as, as much as I didn't like doing it I, and I'm, if you're listening and I took your wedding photos, I loved, I loved you, but I, uh, <laughs> I do what I had to do to, you know, get more equipment and new, you know, video equipment, camera lenses, whatever. Um, but it was my wife really that said, Hey, let's direct your, you know, your passions into an animal and it kind of revived my um, love for animals as well. And it's something that we really like grew, grew closer over. It's amazing. Like the, how the directions everybody takes to get where they need to be as opposed to what they have to do or what they are, are told they have to do in order to make a living and things like that. And I, I think that's, that's great on, you know, finding a partner that is, into you know intuitive enough to see your passions and see that you may be floundering in certain situations and want to get you to where you need to be that being said how so you get you get there why red wolves because it's so uh, and you know we 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 you talked about the stuff you did as a kid um but this and, and tigers i guess there must have been something in your brain already as a young individual that trying to save some of the most endangered species on the planet is that there must have been something that struck a chord with you. So where, how did you find your way to North Carolina to start figuring out about red wolves and how did you find out about them at first and what led you to be part of really this, this project? Yeah. Um, it, it really started with us visiting our friends. Um, every couple of years we have, um, some of my college roommates, uh, moved down here for work. And we'd visit them maybe once or twice a year. And we we loved it down here. The people are great. Um, it's in between three of the, you know, major colleges. Um, something that we really missed since graduating was that sense of community with people that are, you know, plus or minus, you know, so many years of our age. Um, and you know, it's got beautiful mountains. It's got beaches. You know, you just have to you know, direct a little bit. Um, something about New Jersey, there it's such a small state, but so packed full of people. But there's I don't feel any connection there other than family. Um, and we had discussed, well, maybe let's move to the West Coast. That has some of the things that we like, but we both didn't really want to move that far from our family. So North Carolina seemed like a great place to go for a young professional. It's growing. And there's a lot of places to work. And uh, my wife really wanted to move here. So she, when my wife wants something, she makes it happen. So she found a job down here, and we immediately started to look down, um, move down. And um, she, again, she's my biggest advocate. She's always telling me, you know, why don't you just quit your job and do photography full time? She was like, you know, go do what you have to do. I got this. And you know, I'm not going to put all that weight on her shoulders, but I have the support of a partner that, you know, in my opinion is really rare. So I'm really lucky to have that. So she's always pushing me, pushing me along. Um, and so I started trying to figure out, okay, how do I specifically work with these animals? How do I specifically work with a animal? What animal do I even work with? And so I started trying to um, look into that and 
her and I were looking at, you know, what are some of the local animals and, you know, loving, like, I, I liked wolves a lot growing up. Um, but, but if, you know, when I saw that there was this wolf called a, a red wolf, I was like, what is this? And I can't believe I hadn't heard of something called a red wolf. And, and something that is, you know, at the time I thought just only in North Carolina, um, I was like, huh, I guess they're just really endangered, but why haven't I heard of them before? Um, so we moved down here. Um, I started doing a lot of time doing research. Um, I like, I'm the kind of person who likes to plan a lot. And usually it's to my detriment. And sometimes my wife is like, you just got to go, you get a fly, man. You, he pushes me off the ledge. But I did a lot of research and I was just trying to figure out why, why is this wolf not something that people are talking about, you know, there's like wolf weeks and a lot of uh, wolf center or wolf conservation pages don't necessarily post them. And I'm like, Oh, you know, why am I, am I not seeing this? Is this even like a wolf or whatever? And then I found out about how there is some controversy or there used to be some controversy around them possibly being hybrids with coyotes. And that struck a huge chord with me because mm. growing up, I'm I'm half Korean and half you know Caucasian, and I was bullied on both sides of the the um, you know that, and it really just struck a really personal chord to me. And once I saw that and I felt that, I was like, I have to protect these animals at all costs, and I'm going to direct 100 percent of my focus towards that. So all of the build up, all of the research, the trying to figure out how to use social media as a tool to get photos out there. Um, how to edit my photos in the way I do. Um, I, as soon as I found that out, I was like, head in, that's what I'm doing. So what, what was your initial idea of how it would play out to photograph wolves? I mean, it's it's one of the notoriously one of the hardest species to photograph, but were, were you expecting it to be really hard? Were you expecting it to be easier than it was? Or, or how did you think you'd set yourself up to successfully photograph wolves? And did that change when you really started and, and got some experience? Uh, I followed a lot of wolf photographers, uh, start listening to when I found you guys, a lot of wolf centered podcasts and wildlife photography podcasts and try to, you know, set my expectations for what that would be like. And, you know, with a lot, you know, I think that animals are probably the most difficult kind of photography you could do. I've done a lot of things, you know, landscapes, they're not going anywhere. You just got to chase the, <laughs> you know, the sunrise or sunset. Maybe you'll trip on the hike up, whatever, you know, people, you can tell them what to do, but animals are going to do what they want to do and they're going to show up when they want to show up. Um, so I knew that it was going to be difficult. Um, so once I was ready, um, the next step was, okay, how do I find these red wolves? Um, I knew that they had a small pack in Eastern North Carolina at the time. And so what I did was my wife and I reached out to a, a local wildlife guide. And uh, basically, we hired her and we went out there and it was great. We got really lucky because, you know, we, we saw um, maybe four or five red wolf dots. They're like a 1000 meters out, you know, but you know, that dots, that's a red wolf, you could tell by the orange collar in their neck. Um, so I basically started going out there every single weekend that I could. Um, but the more I spent time with them, the more I continued to learn about them, the more, you know, I met um, advocates for the Red Wolf, um, like Ranger uh, Robert Wilcox and some of the other individuals involved with NGOs like the Red Wolf Coalition. Um, I started getting concerned with the amount of time that I was spending out there because, you know, you have to, it has to be the perfect combination of luck to get a photo of a wolf. And for it to be, you know, not just a little red wolf dot in the distance. Um, so it was a lot of trial and error for sure. Yeah. Because I'm look, when I look at your Instagram too, it just a, a lot. I mean, you, some of the photos and the videos you have are, are really quite stunning. And I, and I know, do you go back and forth with working with the NGOs? And, and I think there was a recent one that you posted that was, you said this was taken in inside of whatever, I think the breeding uh, like the breeding compound, or not the compound, but whatever the breeding facility, or the the rescue facility. What's the? We always, especially with photography, we always want. I mean, it clearly seems like you. The, the ethics part is really, you know, it's there for you. What does it mean that you try to tell others when you're doing this? Because because this species is so critically endangered. Because there's so few that are in the wild, and even fewer that are in the breeding programs. Where do the ethics come in? What are the things that you really try to keep in mind when you're photographing out of in, not only in the wild, but also when you're uh, photographing inside of these facilities and trying to promote 
them as a species for conservation efforts? Yeah, it's 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 hugely important, um, and that's something that I'm really glad a lot of the photographers that come on to your podcast uh, bring up and talk about. When you go out to Eastern North Carolina to see the wolves, um, we have some of the biggest, and I think they are the biggest black bears in the United States. They're just you know when you think of a black bear, you don't expect it to be almost the size of a grizzly bear. They're huge out there, and they're very it's a huge population out there. Um, but that's where the red wolves are. So there's the nature preserve where they are mostly located. Um, you'll have families driving around and they're there mostly for the bears and they chase the bears down with the cars. Um, they block the roads, they cut them off when they're trying to cross the roads. And it's, it's really frustrating to see that. And I know that they don't know any better. Um, but you know, the people you think would know better, the photographers, um, who are there for the red wolves, um, have actually gotten roads shut down um, because they're sitting there and waiting for the red wolves to cross the dirt roads. Um, if you go out to that preserve, it's essentially just soybean and cornfields and then dirt roads. Um, and when you have an animal where um, I think what's the exact number of the fish and the wildlife said in July, there's 20 to three to 25 red wolves left. The ethics of how you go about taking the photography are amplified because you know you have a certain level of habituation um, and the main driver of these wolves getting killed, um, besides um, being mistaken for coyotes on private properties, is getting hit by cars. And if they're so used to people, you know, pulling up their cars and jumping out, you know, it's it's going to happen. So um, you have to take the level of ethics that you would use for um, a normal animal, and you know, other wolves, you have to be just as ethical. Um, their red wolves aren't any more special than they are but it just amplified. And once I saw that and I, I really had that understanding, I started thinking, well, what am I doing with myself? What am I doing with these animals? What is the purpose of doing this? And I'm not doing this for clout. I'm not doing this for money. I want people to know that red wolves exist. Um, I don't want it to be a situation where, uh, you know, they unfortunately die out and no one knew, you know, like kind of like the Tasmanian devil where people are like, oh, you know, I wish someone did something about them and now they're gone it's not too late, there's some left. So a lot of what I started turning to do was um, photographing the animals within uh, facilities that are part of the uh, breeding program, the captive breeding program. And I'm able to get, you know, a little bit closer than you normally would. Granted, I'm I'm doing a, a RF 100 to 500 with a 1.4x extender. I'm doing post cropping, post processing. So I'm not as close as I, I look like I am. And that's why I added that uh, disclaimer on my photos. Like, please do not get that close to the wolves in the wild. I mean, if you can even catch them. Um, but I mean, I see some people posting photos of the wolves. And if you see a wild red wolf photo and they're on a road, they're probably laying and waiting out there. And, you know, you're out there and it's it, you have to have some sort of luck to be able to see them. And you don't see them, but I'm sure that those these little red ghosts in the cornfield see you. And how much level of habituation are you causing? Um, is it worth going out there and just getting a blurry photo? Um, you know, what is your reason for being out there? So I do, I, sp I spend a lot of time out um, in the various facilities that have the um, breeding program. I mean, it, it really does seem that you have you, your finger on the pulse of, of this whole situation with them. And, it, and it's great that you're partnering with these NGOs. And, you, you know, you talk about uh, Mr. Wilcox there. And it's, it's great that there really seems to be a community-based type of effort to make sure that everyone's doing the best they can to not only promote conservation efforts to promote the breeding programs, but also to share these stories and promote these animals and, and understanding that, hey, this isn't a subspecies and, and we're going to have Kim Wheeler on next week to, to really discuss, or two weeks from now, to discuss about more in depth about the red wolves, the biology, where they stand on the endangered species. It's just, there's a lot of moving pieces to this um, with the breeding programs. Do you know, as you're working with these NGOs, what is the likelihood that, uh, and if you can answer it or not, Zach, I don't know, the, the likelihood that any of the wolves that are bred in these facilities are able to be able to be they put in the wild and, and they survive? Do you know what kind of that rate is? Or do you have any any experience with that or seeing any of those things happen? Um, I don't know the specific numbers around it, but unfortunately, the decline of the red wolves um, specifically has to do with how they're released. In my opinion, um, they 
from my understanding, were one of the first um, animals to be part of a captive breeding program that laid a lot of the foundations for things like the the Yellowstone wolves in 1995. Um, I think the red wolves were released in the wild originally in 1980 after being, or I'm sorry, 1987 after being declared extinct in the wild in 1980. Um, and that that first pack was released out in eastern North Carolina, and a lot of the methods that they used have been used on some of the some of the other endangered species. Um, their population grew to, I think, something like 120 in the early 2010s. Um, and then uh, fish and wildlife support seemed like it started to kind of wane, um, depending on who you talk to and what NGO you speak with. They, they say it's, you know, a lot of like very prominent landowners that are, have spoken up because the wolves have gone onto their property. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any... Um, attacks from a wolves on, you know, on cattle or something like that. Um, but for one reason or another, you know, fish and wildlife stopped um, releasing the wolves in 2015. And there was a period of three years where there weren't any wild red wolves born. And they were getting hit by cars and they were getting hunted. The fish and wildlife was releasing, I think they did like a special permit to allow someone to shoot a wolf on their property and they were sued basically all the, the local NGOs keep suing them and trying to get the judges to stop them and um, in 2015 they announced that they weren't going to release any more wolves until they updated their um, recovery plan and the recovery plan hasn't been updated since 1990 well they didn't upgrade the um, the plan and they weren't releasing wolves and no more were being born so local NGOs partnered and they, they sued them um, a judge uh, placed an injunction um, telling them that you have to keep letting the wolves out. Um, and so then in 2020, we start seeing, or 2021, around there, they start to release the wolves again. What they'll do is they'll do a soft release where they have an enclosure in the area, um, and they'll eventually, once the animal gets acclimated, they'll re um, release the, um, the wolf into the area, um, or they'll take wolf pups. Um, that were born in captivity and they'll put them in the the litter if it was born relatively um, close enough and last year and this year we were fortunate to have um, I think it was five no six last year with five surviving uh, yearlings and then this year I think it's also five but they were able to place one captive uh, pup in the pack and as far as I know that it they acclimated well um, but yeah it's it's an, it's an ongoing thing and local NGOs are huge in the survival of these animals because um, it, it seemed like an uphill battle. And from my understanding, um, at one point, they just kind of looked at each other like, what do we do? I think it was estimated that the wolf would go extinct again in 2018. Um, and going from a population of 120 down to, you know, possibly being extinct again in the wild in 2018, it's pretty huge. So today, um, again, I think we're 23, 25 red wolves, 14 known. Um, one was shot a month ago, unfortunately. And I, I think I heard that two more were killed again. So, I mean, the number is probably even less than that. So you're, I mean, you're describing this <clears throat> incredibly complex wildlife and, and conservation issue. I mean, all wolf related topics generally seem to be, but how do you personally feel that photography or, or I guess art in general or creativity, whatever, whatever, whatever you'd like to call it, how do, how do you feel like that plays a part? That's a good question. Um, I think, through art, we do some level of storytelling. And the storytelling that I'm trying to push is um, a social one. Um, there's very few wolves. There's probably less wolves than Game of Thrones characters. And if I get people on board with, you know, these animals, um, you know, my goal is to document the ones in the breeding program so that when they are released into the wild, people know from birth to release generations of wolves. And that's ult my ultimate goal right now. Um, because you know, you, you scroll through Instagram and you just see, oh, that's a nice wolf picture. How do you know that's a red wolf? Again, um, I, everyone I've talked to and from my, what I've seen, a lot of people don't know that they exist. And so that's really like my goal is to, I hate to say it, be almost like an influencer. I need to get people to stop and look at the photo. Um, and so it has to be captivating enough for them to at least glance down at the caption and it says the word red wolf. I'm like, oh, okay, red wolf exists. And just shaping that public opinion I'm getting people to care because, you know, the NGOs need help. Um, we need to do everything we can and we need public opinions change. Are there a lot of photographers doing, I mean, kind of focusing in on red wolves like you are? Or are you, you one of only a few or do you know any others? 
Um, I'm aware of a few. Um, some of them are um, wildlife guides. Um, I, I haven't spoken to them about their stances on conservation. Um, I, I really spent a lot more time with, like, for instance, like Robert Wilcox. Um, but I, I'm hoping to build a community that we can, you know, push this forward. Um, but before I even started releasing my photos of the wolves and I was taking photos of them and learning about them, something that I did was I sat there and I, I had to look to see like what people were actually doing and what was working and what wasn't working in it. To me, it seemed like there was a bit of a void. Um, and I was hoping to help fill that and maybe inspire people to also take up arms. I mean, when you look at it on its face, how do you think it's going since you've become a part of this? Do you, do you find that people are engaging with yourself, engaging with the NGOs a little bit more? Do you, do you find that there's at least some traction that's coming from all of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's, there's been a lot of wins recently. Um, that lawsuit that basically forced Fish and Wildlife to come out with that recovery plan that actually came out um, five days ago. I think it was September 29th or something like that. And in it, they outlined um, more um, contemporary um, methods that they're going to um, try. Um, a big problem is the expanding their... Um, where they're allowed to be out in the wild. They've tried the Smoky Mountain Mountains and that pack failed. Unfortunately, the wolves, uh, the pups that were being born there weren't surviving. So unfortunately, that was a failed attempt at a population. Um, but for it to um, persist, they need more packs because I think that I read somewhere that there's 14 DNA, genetic DNA lines that they had identified when they first started the program and there's 12 left. Um, when you're I think there's 200 wolves in captivity over 50 different facilities and they're, they have to be very careful with how they select the wolves for the breeding program. Um, because, you know, there's diseases, you know, that can, or genetic defects that can happen with some level of, you know, inbreeding. No, I mean, it's, no, I, I see what you're doing too. I mean, I'm looking at your posts as we're, as we're talking here and I mean, you, you know, you share a beautiful photo and then it's like you said, or a, or a video and it's really trying to make sure that somebody's going to look at the the point you're trying to make, which is educate others, donate to conservation organizations. It, it's tough when we're, because we come from a space of working with a nonprofit of trying to educate just about wolves in general. And so that's such a polarizing subject. And then when you get into other types of wolves, if you talk about Mexican grays and then you go to red, red wolves. And so it really is it's almost a, a, a smaller slice, a smaller niche of the pie that is wolves in general. Because I think when people talk about wolves, they think about wolves, we're talking about grays and timbers and the ones that are in Alaska and the ones that are in the West. And so when, like you say, when you're in this even more niche part of an already niche conversation, it's a little bit tough to do that. But I, I, you know, we, we love what you're doing in terms of trying to make those things more accessible to people. What do you do when you're out in the world? If you're out, you know, photographing, if you're sharing stuff, if you're out just in, what's the information that you're trying to speak to people? Is it the same? Do you take a different approach? What are some of the conversations that you end up having about red wolves in North Carolina? What's the base, what's the gist that you get from people that you talk to? Uh, well, first I try to see like what, you know, side of the fence they're on when they're talking so I can kind of alter my approach to that. Um, but for the most part, they just think they're either coyotes or gray wolves. They don't they don't know what they're looking at. Um, and if they're even, uh, for instance, if I'm out at the refuge, they don't even know they're out there. Um, hmm. So if they're saying like, "Oh, have you guys seen a bear?" Um, I think if you talk to anyone who's been out there, you'll you'll run into somebody who said, "Oh, yeah, I saw some wolves, but you know, I'm really looking for the bears." And like they don't realize how rare that you know <laughs> sighting that that was. And so what I do is I always point them out gently that you know you know, you actually had a really rare experience, you know, you, that little thing you saw was, you know, I call it the red ghost, you know, it just pops up and disappears, it floats across the field, and it's gone just like that. And that was an incredible experience that you just had. Or if I'm at, you know, a place like the Durham Museum of Life and Science, where they have um, Oak and Nico, some of my favorite um, uh, captive breeding wolves, and they're sitting there looking at him like, oh, you know, there's wolves in North Carolina. And so I, I like to point that out like yeah there were wolves in North Carolina you know this one's very unique to the United States and I'll give them some little basic facts and see if I can get their attention and um, they blend in so well to the environment so even at you know at a place like the Life and Science Center um, they show up and they're looking and looking like oh you know Oak is right up there or Nico's running around over there you know they blend in so well. So you go to the um, captive 
release program sites, but how often do you see, how often do you get to see red wolves in, in the wild? You, per, you personally, um, it used to be almost every weekend I'd see like a dot or something, but I've, um, completely limited that to be honest, because again, what I, what I'm trying to do is tell a story. Um, I don't need necessarily to have a wild photo of the wolf. Um, and it's a hundred, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for sure to do, but at the end of the day, if I were to get lucky enough to get that shot, um, like I mentioned earlier, every time I'm out there, even if I don't see them, they see me, they smell me, they whatever, and I'm causing part of the problem. People are welcome to go out to the, the nature preserve. That's you know what they're for. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, some of the other photographers aren't so ethical, and I don't want to add to that problem. So I limit it. I, I go out maybe like once a month or so um, now, but otherwise I spend almost every other day at some sort of breeding facility. And again, my, I think my long-term goal is to visit the ones that have them for public display. Um, not all of them do. Um, and now of them advertise that they have them, for instance, um, the North Carolina, um, NC state, they didn't really, at, um, publicly say that they had red wolves and for the breeding program. And the rumor is, is that they were really scared of, the kids from Duke stealing the wolves hmm. because of, you know, stealing mascots as a prank. And uh, the only reason I'm saying that they have them now is because they, they put out some information publicly over the last couple of months. So I think it's okay to, to talk about them now, but it's kind of like the secret wolves of Raleigh, North Carolina, you know? Wow. Uh, but I, I do try to limit my time out there. I don't want to add to the problem. I mean, I, I, yeah, I feel that. I mean, we were just in Yellowstone not too long ago and it was the same thing about, it, we saw a lot of bears. Uh, we didn't see any wolves this time, but it was the same people chasing, chasing bears out of their cars with their phones and chasing us. So with, with cubs, which again, not, not the brightest idea to do, uh, especially in a, in a park like that. Yeah. Um, when, when you're, you always talk about these encounters about, you, you know, even in the breeding facility and, and when you talk to people that are out there with you and they, and you tell them, Hey, this is an experience that you just had that you might not have wanted to have, or you weren't intending to have, but you had it anyway. What are those moments like for you, especially when you first started and you, you, you know, you say you plan things out, you are, it seems like a meticulous individual. So what is it like for you when you're just out there once a month or, or even prior when you're out in the wild and you have these experiences and you have these moments with these wolves, what are the things that really come up for you? as you're there behind the lens and you're looking through the viewfinder or you take a step back, where, where, where do you sit with that with yourself? Honestly, I forget to breathe and I see it. I kind of almost like hold my breath and um, I have my camera on. Very, I, so I use the um, Canon R3 um, because they can, it's just a little flash of red in the, in the, the field. So I have it on a very high shutter speed and I just like, you know, I'm holding my finger, staring at it. And I'm holding my breath the whole time. Um, but I'll never forget my first time seeing a wild red wolf. Um, it was on that first time I went out to the preserve. It was the end of the day. We had seen a couple of wolves off in the distance. I think they were the yearlings from the year prior. And the end of the day, we were um, about to leave because the I think the preserve closes at sunset. And we had seen a, a paw print on the dirt road earlier. And we're like, you know, we'll we'll drive back here at, um, in the evening to see if we can have see something. And on the way out, we saw little red ears flicker maybe 100 meters out. And we, you know, pulled over, got out, and um, across the little dirt road um, coming out of the bushes was, um, I don't remember her number designation, um, and that's something I'm definitely going to start doing is naming the wolves to make it easier for people to follow. Um, but she was the sister of the matron of the pack um, out, out there, um, and she was at the time the oldest wild red wolf. She was 14 years old, which is a huge testament to the efforts to prevent the wolves from getting hit by cars. They have um, electronic signs out there and uh, community information. And it's just a huge testament to all the efforts of everybody there. But 14 years old, um, and two days later, Fish and Wildlife announced that um, her collar went into mortality mode and she had passed away of natural causes. And so as far as I know, I was my wife and I and the guy we were with were the last people to see her alive. And to me, that was just this, this moment where... I, I did all this research. I had a plan for how I want to go about it and um, to finally be out there and have this, uh, you know, pretty close encounter um, and it to be her last. Um, to me, it was, you know, I took that as a sign as I'm doing the right thing. I, I, I should be here and I really need to help these animals. 
what is it like for you as a photographer? Do you feel that things gravitate to you or do you make the situations happen? I think Stevens asked this a couple of times, but it, every time we talk to a photographer, it always seems like the things are attracted to the individual. Do you feel that's how it is? I mean, you just sort of said it there, but do, have you felt since you've been on this journey and now that you're, you know, really campaigning and, and for this, for the species specifically, that it's all coming around to you in a way that is showing that, you know, your work is valid, validated and things that you're doing mean something? Uh, I, I used to not always feel that way. Um, usually the validating voice is uh, my wife. I, I get imposter syndrome um, quite a bit. Um, but as I started um, to work with these animals, I started, you know, having encounters like that, bumping into people involved with, you know, some of the NGOs, bumping into other photographers and, you know, right time, right place. And, you know, I try really hard to pay forward everything and throughout my life. And I, I do think that, you know, these instances are, you know, just signs that I'm on the right path and I'm trying to do the right thing. Is there, is there any, I mean, do you hear any stories of poaching of red wolves in North Carolina? Uh, not poaching. It's a, it's a lot of mistaking them for coyotes. coyotes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, they do, they, they do the euthanization program out here. Um, and they also, and when they do that, they give them a black collar. The red wolves have a, a bright orange collar. Um, but people will still shoot them. There've been a couple over the, over the years, fish and wildlife will investigate them. Um, but not specific, uh, poaching that I'm aware of or trapping or anything like that. What are the ways that they're trying to protect them? You talked about some of the electronic signs, I guess, uh, for when people are driving, what are some of the other things that they're trying to implement to make sure that people are aware that red wolves are there, you're in their habitat area and to make sure that really to keep an eye out for them or what are the things that they're putting to, to make sure people are aware just, just to be aware that they're there. Big thing is the signs, um, because I think such a high level of mortality was coming from getting hit by cars. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know the exact number, but quite a few of them, um, were killed. Um, there's a documentary that came out by uh, another local wildlife photographer, um, called Rite of Passage. It's, it's a great video and it talks about, the roadways that bisect the preserves and how it, it causes such a high level of deaths. Um, I think that those are much more common than uh, mistaking them for coyotes to my understanding. Um, so I think that that is just the biggest thing. Uh, strangely though, when you get onto the preserve where they're located, there's a sign at the entrance and a sign at the exit that there are red wolves, you know, be careful. But when you're in there, there's not really any signs about etiquette or, you know, things to be aware of. Um, but the, the signs are the biggest thing. And what are the, so are you, are you looking in the future to, but because you've, you have these, these ethics already as a photographer, are you looking to maybe create some sort of pamphlet information signage, something that you can work with the NGOs about to possibly put that out there about the etiquette, about saying, Hey, be aware that they're here. Don't do X, Y, and Z. Is that something that's come across your mind? Yeah, I've heard some other photographers thinking about putting some of that information together. And when I asked them about it, they said that, well, they just handed it to Fish and Wildlife. So it's up to them what they want to do with it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to really push for that kind of information to be easily handed out or downloaded um, by the local NGOs. Um, I definitely want to advocate for some sort of uh, sign that says like, hey, don't, some common sense signs like, hey, don't chase the bears or you don't chase the wolves, you know, but um, there's a lot of common sense things that you would think that should be done that aren't necessarily done. All you got to do is look at Turon's Yellowstone and that you'll show that common sense is lacking to a degree in some places. <laughs> um, it's, it just shows every day. Uh, when you're, when you're looking at the future, when you're looking at your trajectory and I, I guess your wife's trajectory to that, to that matter too, you know, you guys seem to be really embedded in this in this place in North Carolina with you, especially with the Red Wolves. Is this your focus for years to come? Is you know, is it, are you going to be traveling? What do you, what do you think? This is your your long term situation. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely interested in other animals and especially other wolves. Um, I know this weekend we're going to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I'm going to try to photograph um, the elk um, that they have up there. Uh, but as far as conservation efforts go, this is, like I said, as soon as I realized that I had that personal connection, I'm going to protect these things at all costs. I'm, I'm going to do that. So I'm, I'm kind of all in. My plan is to 
try to carry that torch and bring it forward. Um, my master's is in policy. Um, I had some great teachers um, that really like pushed, you know, make sure you identify all the stakeholders. Um, when I was with Homeland Security getting my intelligence analyst certifications, we learned about wicked web solutioning. It's basically a problem doesn't have one answer. And that answer might come from different places than you might think of. It might be out of the box. And there's always going to be unknown stakeholders. And so in the long term, I'm looking to really get involved with the NGOs as much as I can, try to carry that torch forward. Um, I'm also looking to, after I get out of the stage of get people to know that Red Wolves exist, you know, basically trying to get people invested into the, the specific wolves because, again, there's not that many of them. And if I can, you know, name them and get people on board with them, then they'll be invested in saying, oh, if unfortunately one gets accidentally hit by a car or they or we celebrate a ruin like having births, everybody's there for every step of the way. And so that's my goal um, is to document as many generations of wolves as I can and carry that torch forward. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Like like you said, the visual storytelling, the the storytelling in general is really the the peak level of where you get people interested. What's the sentiment around North Carolina in general that you that you've been able to gather for Red Wolves, Red Wolf conservation? Is it something that's at the forefront of people's minds? Is it sort of in the rear view? It's one of those things where they'll donate every once in a while. Where what are you seeing as you as you've been there for a little bit? What is it really like? Depends on where you are. Um, here in in Raleigh, they'll the sentiment is, oh, I didn't know we had wolves. Oh, okay. And then they'll you know they'll donate. They'll tell people. Um, but the sentiment is pretty favorable. But if you go out to some of the more rural areas, they're a pest. They're on my property. They're whatever. And again, there's twenty three, twenty five. <laughs> the likelihood of you <laughs> actually seeing a red wolf on your property it was probably a coyote. And so the sentiment is that they're nuisances um, and they're like, oh, they're attacking our farmland and what, are, what have you. That's I had some interesting um, conversations at um, some truck stops stopping to get a, a monster after a, a, an all-nighter, you know, but um, yeah, it's, it's very depending on where you are. Yeah, we've seen that's, that's really been the issue is, not even the issue, just really that's the way you constructed how the country is in terms of this issue, the wolf issue. Uh, it seems to be very divided down the middle. Uh, about where it really depends on where you are, um, because we just had a we just had a podcast talking about Canada, and it really seems across the board that they're thought of positively. So it's just interesting how the dynamics change, country to country, where you live, and and how that goes. So for you, what's the best information, Zach, that people can access about Red Wolves? Where can they find stuff that you're doing? Where can they? donate where can they just be a part of it to learn more just like you did because you, you didn't know about this species you dove all in so what's a starter kit i would say for somebody who wants to learn about they're listening to this they want to learn more about red wolves how do they begin that journey i definitely visit the red wolf coalition's website um, and champions for wildlife i think they used to be called wheeler woods um, they have some great information there. They'll post updates on what's going on, some of the wins. Um, you can also donate your photos there. Um, they have them for basically you don't you down um, you can download photos from other photographers that were donated and they're they're free to use, um, especially for educational purposes. Um, and they also have ways that you can donate as well. Uh, if you want to get started in uh, photographing anything, anything wild, I mean, uh, one of my hobbies is bonsai, right? And you know, one of the misconceptions about bonsai is you grow a tree from a seed. Well, it takes 20 years to grow from a seed into a tree. And what after that, what do you do with it? So it's kind of similar to wildlife. I think that if you just jump into an animal in the wild and you don't, you don't have the practice, you know, let's get some practice because you don't want to miss that moment. Um, so go to, go to your local zoo, go uh, accredited facility, um, see what they have. Um, there's, 50 facilities around the country that are part of the Red Wolf um, captive breeding program. Um, there's 200, 214 some odd wolves. Not all of them are public, but if you check your local um, accredited facility, they likely have red wolves and just go out there and, you know, have a blast taking photos. Again, don't make sounds, don't bait them, do, do anything to um, alter their behavior. Um, I think that um, the best advice I can give for ethical photography is if the animal looks at you, or changes its behavior in any way, you're too close, or you're making too much noise. You almost have to have like that mentality of a hunter to who doesn't want to get noticed and scare away the animal. Um, 
But for my work, um, right now I'm just on Instagram, um, Zachly.jpg. Um, I'm starting TikTok, that's Zachly.mp4. <laughs> um, I don't have any work for sale right now. Um, I'm really just trying to focus on their conservation. I might start putting um, images of the red wolf up, but it might be just in limited quality. Um, there'll be some other animals up there eventually, but um, definitely just follow my page, follow you know pages like yours, and just share, 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 get the, the word red wolf out there. Um, because a win, a win for any wolf is a win for all the wolves for sure. I love that. That's a great sentiment. Is your goal, by the way, to, are you going to try and visit all 50 facilities? Because that's, uh, it is. Yeah, that's okay. my, that's my, that's my main goal. I'm trying to document them because they get shifted around. Um, so the, the ones here at, in, um, the Durham Museum of Life and Science, Oak and Nico, they've been together for two years now. Um, and they haven't bred, um, Oak is very flirty, but Nico is not receptive for some reason. Um, I think. Um, they have something called an MSI score, or it's basically how well do their genetics pair in a way that will result in um, an atom, uh, a pup that is, you know, free of like defects and stuff like that. Um, I think Oak and Nico are an MSI of four, and you don't want to exceed a four. Um, to my understanding, they found a new candidate where if they swap the males, it's an MSI of two for both sides. I don't remember what state this wolf is coming from. So they get swapped around a lot. So hopefully, you know, we'll get some pups this winter. Um, but they get swapped around so much that I I, I want to follow their story. Um, I might not get around to 200. So I'm definitely hoping to find a community of other photographers that can help me document them. But my goal is to get out there and, and document them so that as they get moved around, as they have pups, as they get released into the wild, Hopefully, the good things that are starting to happen for the Red Wolves um, recently uh, continue to snowball forward in the right direction, and we'll get some more um, designated areas for them. And I'm hoping that some of them will get released really since the wild. So my my goal is to get out to all of them. Man, yeah, that yeah, that's gonna be a crazy. That's a crazy story that you're gonna be able to tell. Is that if you can follow them around and you get like you said, getting a network. Anybody listening who wants to take pictures of Red Wolves to contact Zach. You know, what I mean, this is. It's a big deal uh, to talk about red wolves and, and really to get the the information and, and all the stuff out there. Zach, my last question for you is when you hear the word wolf, what's the thing that comes to your mind? I think unity because the wolf success or failure is really dependent on how we as people are able to come together, set aside our differences across whatever lines and help, help, help each other help the wolves. Um, so I think that its success is really determined on how well, we as people are able to come together. So I think unity for sure. It's a great word. And it's great. Listen, everything that you're doing is is fantastic. Uh, like Zach said, follow his follow his Instagram. He has some absolutely incredible photos. Again, it's ZachLee.jpg on Instagram. <laughs> and we're going to have more Red Wolf stuff in the coming weeks for all you listening out there. Zach, thanks again, man. This yeah. is really great. Thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. uh, your, your photos are incredible, my brother. Thank you really so great. much. Yeah, uh, just stick just stick around for just a minute. Uh, how's to you all out there? And Stephen, I'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? Please visit our website at wolfconnection.org, where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer.